it is. Is that good? version of that particle that's heavier and we haven't detected it yet. Whatever the lightest supersymmetric particle is, it can be stable because it doesn't have more supersymmetric particles to decay into, um, and that makes it a good candidate to be a dark matter particle. It's heavy and it's stable. And this is motivated by the WIMP miracle, um, which answers the question, why is there almost as much dark matter in the universe as there is regular matter? There's six times as much dark matter in the universe. If these were made completely independently, and there was no way of the dark matter to ever talk to standard model particles in the universe, why are they almost the same number? Why not a million times as much dark matter? Why not one million this time, times as much dark matter? The solution is that dark matter and normal baryonic matter can interact somehow in the early universe, uh, then they can, they can agree on how much they're supposed to be of each. And the miracle was, if you have a particle that, has a, that interacts using the weak force, which we already know about, um, it has a mass that suggests it interacts via the weak force, which is about 100 proton masses, then that particle would have the correct density today in the universe, given, its, uh, given the interactions that would happen in the very early universe. But notice that that's a weak interaction. We can see weak interactions today. So if they can happen early on in the universe, weak interactions, then I can look for the weak interactions. Wimp particles tell me exactly what I'm trying to look for. I'm trying to look for a weak force interaction between a dark matter particle and a standard model particle. And there are three ways that can happen, um, the three different ways I'm going to try to detect WIMPs. And it's shown in this kind of fake Feynman diagram here. So for a Feynman diagram, um, it has inputs and outputs. But you can have time go in any direction in this diagram, and it, and it makes sense. So um, you can do what's called production at colliders, something like at the LHC. You have time flowing from the right to the left. You start with two standard model particles, say, say two protons or two quarks. They crash into each other. They produce, among other things, two dark matter particles. And you, you can look for hints of those dark matter particles in your collider. You can do what's called direct detection. Uh, now time is flowing from bottom to top. You start with a dark matter particle and a standard model particle. They bump off of each other, and you end up with that same dark matter particle and the same standard model particle. Two particles, they bump, they move on. Right? And you can look for a dark matter particle coming in and making some change in the energy of the standard model particle in that collision. Lastly, you can look at what's called indirect detection. This is 
two dark matter particles you start with, you're going time from left to right. Uh, two dark matter particles, they collide, uh, they're antiparticles of each other, so they annihilate and they produce standard model particles, and we look for those standard model particles that we can't see. These are the three different ways to look for dark matter uh, with WIMPs, and everything in here is going to be some sort of weak interaction. I don't know, I don't know what goes on in here, that's why it's all grayed out in the blobby thing, uh, because I don't know what this interaction is yet, that's what I'm searching for, but I think it's going to be about a weak force interaction. Um, okay, that's actually just what I said. Okay, let's, uh, let's go. But remember, it's called the weak force for a reason, because it's really weak. These interactions don't happen very often. And we talked about last week how the interactions can happen in the early universe very commonly. The weak force is almost as strong as the electromagnetic force in the early universe. And that's because the primary reason the weak force is weak is because the carriers, this W and Z boson, are very heavy. So you have to push a lot of energy out to communicate between particles. In the early universe, you had a lot of energy. Assume these W and Z bosons are like this bowling ball here. Uh, if you have a really uh, you know, strong guy, you can, you can throw it very fast. There can be a lot of interactions between him and the bowling pins. Um, now, in the, in the universe today, we don't have a lot of energy. We're like this small child. And when he rolls the ball, it will not make it to the end of the cord. Some attendant is going to have to go out and fix it. And it will get stuck in a gutter. And there will be no interactions between the child and the bowling pins. Um, so it's the weak force. So we're looking for an interaction that very, very rarely this kid manages to actually push the ball. And it actually makes it all the way to the pins. And everyone cheers uh, when it stops. It doesn't actually knock anything over. <laughs> Okay, let's see. There you go. So the solution is we need really sensitive machines, right? We're looking for a very rare interaction. So we need a machine that has a large area um, so it can look for a lot of different interactions. And it also has to be sensitive to individual particle interactions against a background of baryonic interactions, which might use the electromagnetic force and happen much, much more often. So you need very sensitive, uh, very background free. Um, machines that can look for a, look through a lot of interactions very quickly. So let's start off with particle accelerators um, like the LHC or the Tevatron and Fermi level, um, which used to be wrong. Uh, so we'll talk about the Large Hadron Collider. Um, but first, uh, I think many people here may have visited the Tevatron at some point, or at least know about it. It's in Batavia, so uh, you can take the uh, Metro West out there, I think. Uh, and then a uh, taxi. It's a, that is a 4.26 mile rig. You can see it here. You can go up to the top of Wilson Hall over there, look in. Uh, I worked there for a year. It's, uh, it's boring farmland. Um, but, but there is a very cool rig and a, and a fun particle accelerator. Um, the main rig is no longer functioning. Um, it was decommissioned in 2011. Um, but there is still uh, injector rings over here. Oh, this is the injector ring. That's the main ring in the background. Uh, the injector ring is still running and, and is used for neutrino experiments. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, um, where, where uh, high energy particle physics, physics is now being done. Um, so it's a 17 mile ring, um, unlike the 4.26 mile ring at the Tevatron. The LHC ring is actually about 1,000 feet underground, which is where all the action occurs down here. Uh, the Tevatron actually is only uh, like tens of feet underground. So you can actually kind of see the bump in the dirt where the, where the ring moves around. The LHC can accelerate particles um, to 7 TeV and have 14 TeV collision between two different particles, which means they're accelerating protons to 0.99999, some other nines, uh, times the speed of light, which means that over a second, this proton is only going to travel three meters slower than, than light would travel in the same time. So very, very close to the speed of light. Um, and this is a proton-proton collider. Uh, the Tevatron is actually a proton-antiproton collider, um, which only makes technical differences. So how do you accelerate protons? Um, well, you need to kick your power cord. Um, you need to um, have a large electric field, right, and the proton's a charged particle, and you're going to push it around. And then you want to accelerate it for a really long distance, right? with these electric fields, and so you go around in a circle. That's why these are all circles. So the particle travels around this circle many, 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 many times, um, being pushed by this electric field every time. And you need strong magnets now to bend this, this proton so that it actually travels in a circle and doesn't just you know, shoot out of your detector. 
Um, the LHC uses 1,600 superconducting magnets, which are 27 tons apiece. Um, these magnets are kept cool at superconducting temperatures using 100 tons of liquid helium. Um, and it's the largest superconducting magnetic structure in the world. Um, and let's see, I'm, I apparently am halfway through this video, but let's try to play it here. Uh, there we go. Um, so there's actually a number of rings at the LHC. So, so what they do is they take a, a hydrogen atom, and uh, first they're going to show some stuff. They take a hydrogen atom and they split it, and they're going to send it into this ring here. And this ring is supposed to accelerate it to, to relatively uh, modest energies, I think a few MeV or something like that. Oh, there's a nifty little driving gauge here. 50 MeV, apparently, in this, uh, in this synchrotron beam. And then the, the proton's going to go out into a larger beam. Um, as you go, you want larger and larger rings because you want this path to look more and more like a straight line. Because the more you bend a proton, the more energy you lose because you're changing the direction of things, right? That requires a collision which removes energy from the protons. So you accelerate these protons, you feed them into this going in two opposite directions, and eventually, uh, the video freezes, and then they collide in the center, um, which is some large detector. So we'll, we'll go on to the large detector. You accelerate these protons to tremendous energy, you hit them together in the center of two different detectors that are at the LHC. One is called uh, the Atlas Detector, uh, stands for a toroidal LHC apparatus, which is the worst acronym I've ever heard of. <laughs> um, it's a 46 meters long detector, it's 25 meters in diameter, it weighs 7,000 tons, there's a guy down there about. Um, it's a big thing. Um, and it has 3,000 kilometers of cable. Um, there's also the CMS detector. This is the compact uh, muon solenoid detector. It uses a very different technology. Um, it's only 21.6 meters long. It's 15 meters in diameter, but it's 14,000 tons. Um, the, way to, the way to kind of differentiate these is if you took the Atlas detector and you put it in a bunch of packaging and you dropped it in the ocean, it would float, and CMS would not. <laughs> so uh, two different detectors, and that's important, right, because uh, you want your instruments to be separately built with different sets of uncertainties and systematics by different teams who might have made different mistakes. And there's a good firewall between these two groups, right? If the LHC sees something weird, we're not going to have, we're not going to say, okay, let's build another uh, multi-billion dollar detector and uh, just stick it in and see what happens, right? We want two groups that can check each other's results. So there's a firewall in communication between the CMS team and the Atlas team so that um, when they get results, they don't know what the other group is getting, and they have a different type of detector, and you know, we trust that if they're both getting the same thing, that uh, there's some real physics there. And uh, they're both, of course, fed the same beam by a separate team that just manages the beam and doesn't care about the detectors. And what do these detectors see? Well, they see particle collisions. They see protons crashing into each other at tremendous energies. Such high energies, in fact, then you can't treat the proton as just a, an object, like a proton, right? I mean, it's, it's composed of uh, you know, two up quarks and a down quark, like we talked about last week. Um, and what happens is not actually proton-proton collisions, it's up quark-up quark collisions, or up quark-down quark collisions. Or actually, most of the time, there's, there's gluons that hold these protons together, and gluons can interact with each other. So actually, um, almost all the collisions you see are gluon-gluon collisions. Uh, two of these force-carrying particles interacting with each other inside the proton and producing new particles. Um, some of these things crash. Here's a big event. Um, and then this is, this is your detector here. It's a cylinder like this, so this is kind of the apogee. And this is all the other the areas on the edge of the detector that got hit by some particle during this collision. So you see some of these little things got hit. Um, there was some big jet of tons of particles that came and hit a bunch of stuff in the detector out here. Um, they've reproduced which direction all these particles were moving in, so they get tracks for which direction every particle was coming in. Um, what's important um, for, for hadronic uh, accelerators like this, proton accelerators, um, is that I know that this came in at 7 TeV, and I know that this came in at 7 TeV, but I don't know how much energy was in the, in the two quarks when they hit each other. They had some portion of the 7 TeV energy, and it's not simply one-third. There's actually a, a function, and it's a kind of a, a quantum mechanical fluctuation. 
So you don't actually know for any, any collision between these two particles how much collision energy the things that hit each other actually had. Right? So you have some continuum going up to 14 TeV, although the majority of your collisions actually happen at about a TeV or so. They're much less energy um, than the total energy that could happen. Um, this is contrasted with, say, um, electron accelerators, like what happens at um, uh, SLAC as a, a linear accelerator in California. Um, that can't go to as high of energy um, because it's, at, it's much harder to bend electrons in a ring uh, than it is with protons. Um, but you do know that the energy is actually in the electron because it's, in, as far as we know, an indivisible particle, and it has all the energy in this collision. So you know what energy the collisions are happening at. That's a complexity in these sort of accelerators. How do you analyze this? Well, the raw data rate of this is 100 terabytes per second, uh, which is incredible. Um, so you know, you, you have a two terabyte hard drive if you have a really good computer at home, and you fill 50 of those per second. Um, and that goes on for a year where you fill, you know, uh, uh, 150 million or something like that. Um, well, you can't possibly analyze that amount of data in real time. So what you actually have are hardware triggers, which is your first, and those, these are basically, you, you don't have time to write software because your software packages aren't fast enough. So you actually build a processor that just analyzes data and gets rid of boring events. And that gets rid of 99.9999% of the events, which are just things that we know a lot about. We're not too interested in them. And it leaves about 100 events out of the 100 million events that happen per second um, that are worth analyzing, that are interesting events, and can get sent to software packages around, the, or you know, computers around the world to actually analyze them in great detail. Um, so you get about 3 billion interesting events per year, which you serve, uh, save on. Uh, 30,000 terabytes of disk space per year in total data. Um, the LHC, or CERN, actually has uh, data links to large data centers in the world. And this is just kind of an outline of CERN, and they have their own fiber optic connection, so they have like a two 8.5 gigabyte per second connections to Fermilab um, that are their, their own fiber optic cable. So we're constantly getting streams of data from CERN and, and being transported around the world in this huge data network. Um, where I think almost uh, uh, several hundred thousand uh, processors here that are constantly analyzing LHC data. So, so the, the data computer science challenge on itself is, is worthy of talks. Um, it's pretty incredible. Now, how do you search with, for dark matter? And there's a, there's a key problem here, right? I have a, I have a particle collision. I had two, I had two quarks come in. And they, uh, they annihilated each other and they produced dark matter particles. And uh, those dark matter particles I can't see. Remember, they don't interact with light. So once I produce them, they fly out of my detector. They don't get picked up by the detector because the detector interacts with things that interact with light. And I don't see anything. So there's no way to distinguish two quarks coming in and making two dark matter particles from what usually happens, which is two quarks come in and they miss each other. Right, that's almost all, all of the things that happen. I, I throw tons of particles at each other every time I go around this loop, and um, you know, 99.999999% of them miss. Um, so I need some way to detect that I made dark matter without actually seeing dark matter. Um, so maybe I get lucky. Maybe what happens is, is during this collision, I also produce a gluon here. Um, and what, what does that do for me? Well, uh, imagine what happens in, 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 in billiards, right? You shoot a pool ball at um, all of the, uh, at some at some cube, and all of the balls fall off, fly off in different directions, right? And you know that momentum is conserved, which means that the initial velocity and, and momentum of this cue ball has to equal the final momentum of all the different cue balls in all the directions they move, right? Pretend that you couldn't see this uh, the eight ball in the middle, right? Uh, it, was, it was a dark matter ball and uh, you can't find it. Um, well, if you add up how all of the other balls moved that you can see, you would say, huh, I started with this most momentum, and I ended up with a different amount of momentum at the end, right? not the same as I started with. And so I would predict, hey, there was an extra billiard ball here somewhere, and it moved in a direction that saved the momentum problem. right? It moved in the direction that balanced momentum. So what I want to look for is, um, some collision where I have some gluon flying off in a direction 
and there's nothing flying off in the opposite direction. So I'm thinking that there was something, and I just didn't see it, right? Um, so this is called uh, missing PT, which is missing transverse momentum. Um, transverse momentum being the, the, the machine is a diameter. I'm looking for momentum to go this way across the machine when the beam goes this way. I'm looking for, for missing momentum in the opposite direction. The reason I'm looking only in the opposite direction is because I don't know how fast these things hit each other. So I don't know actually what the momentum is in this direction, and there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, but in the transverse momentum, they were almost going straight, so there is no momentum going this way. So if everything flies off this way, I know something came the opposite direction that I should see. Here's an example event uh, simulation, of course, or else we would have done that matter. In, uh, in uh, uh, the Atlas detector, so I had some particle collision, and this is just shown in a 2D kind of cutout of what the detector looks like, so a circle. And I had a, a quark, uh, a jet from quarks go this way and one go this way. And I say, hey, that doesn't add up. There needed to be something else coming in this other direction that I missed. And that must be some, something I didn't see. Well, there's, this, is, this is the search for, for missing uh, PT events. And there's no indication at present. And there are also backgrounds that I have to deal with. Um, so for instance, what happens if um, I have uh, this collision here, but what I produced was not dark matter, dark matter, it was two neutrinos, right, with a lot of energy. Well, like we talked about before, neutrinos also don't interact with light. They only interact with the weak force. So I'm not going to see them in my detector either. So that I missed some momentum in some collision at some point, doesn't tell me that it was dark matter for sure. It could just be something else that I don't see for some reason. So there are a bunch of backgrounds. Um, I don't remember if this was an Atlas or a CMS search. Um, this is how many times you expected a, a missing amount of at least so much missing momentum. And here are the different processes that we know about and how much they were supposed to produce. They were supposed to produce about 1,224 events that were missing at least some amount of momentum. They observed 1,112. 42, how can I talk? 1,142 is what they observed. And uh, so there, there's no indication that there are extra events that were dark matter in origin. And so using that, you can produce constraints on uh, how dark matter interacts with matter, um, for instance. And here's a plot. I'm going to stop for a second and talk about it because you will see this over the next three weeks uh, all the time. This is the mass of the dark matter particle. This is in GeV. A GeV is about a proton mass, almost. It's very close to a proton mass. So you can say this is how many proton masses uh, this dark matter particle weighs from 1 up to 1,000. And this is the annihilation rate, how often two dark matter particles will collide and produce standard model particles in the early universe. This uh, number here, uh, this dashed line is important. It's 3 times 10 to the minus 26. And this is what's called the thermal relic cross-section. This is how often dark matter needs to collide and produce standard model particles in the early universe if I want the dark matter density to be the number that we measure the dark matter density to be, about 20% of the total density of the universe. So you're hoping that you're, you're, you find a dark matter candidate that's around here. Um, here are some of the models that got ruled out, basically everything above this line by, by dark matter searches. And you'll notice they're constraining. Um, for instance, for this blue line here, uh, things that would annihilate at the thermal relic cross-section that we want are ruled out if the dark matter is less than 80 times the mass of a proton. Um, but this is model dependent. This is what's called the D8 model. This one here is the D5 model. There are lots and lots of different models because we don't know what that interaction is um, in the early universe, what type of interaction there is, and there are about, I think, uh, <coughs> 20 or so options. And each one, you have to map from how often you expected particle collisions in the LHC to early universe interactions. They all map differently, and so you would have 20 different lines here and different things ruled out. Uh, actually, here they all are. There are uh, 14 D-type interactions, which are uh, for Dirac particles, uh, six C-type interactions, and four R-type interactions. I don't remember what those are. Um, so, so there are a bunch of interactions. Each one has its own mapping. So. Uh, this is a slightly different plot of dark matter mass versus what you expect in direct detection experiments, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But you can see there are orders of magnitude difference uh, based on exactly which interaction you're talking about. So um, 
these results are really um, constraining for certain models and really not constraining for certain other models of particle physics. And you'd want to be able to rule out all of them, right? If you wanted to kind of rule out this wimp dark matter scenario, you need to be able to get rid of all of these types of interactions with accelerators. On the other hand, let's say we do detect something in a particle accelerator. Well, that tells us a lot about what the dark matter act interaction actually is, because it, it's going to give us hints about which type of models these can and can't be. Right? Um, you, you would say, well, we found uh, 20 uh, interactions that we think are dark matter, and this model predicts 20, and this model predicts 50,000, so it's not that model. Right? Um, and this model only predicts 0 .001, so it's not that model either. It would tell us a lot about how dark matter interacts with standard model particles if we were to find this in the, in the LHC, gives us additional information. <laughs> Another thing you can do with particle accelerators is you can look for supersymmetry directly. And this is the thing that the LHC is the best at uh, and was really built for, is to look for some hints that there is a supersymmetric universe, that we found superparticles, and that would give us a hint because weakly interacting massive particles are based in this paradigm of supersymmetry, it would give us a hint that, that we're on the right track in looking for, for wimp dark matter. Um, so a lot of the superparticles do interact with light, or do interact uh, with, uh, say, the strong force, which happens very quickly and produces a bunch of things you can detect. So you can rule out or, or try to detect those superparticles and use that to inform whether or not you could find dark matter or not. So here are just um, some, some, I think these are actually old um, plots, of the, the mass of the what's called the stop, the, the supersymmetric particle of the top quark. Um, and these kind of red areas over here are ruled out, and this is the mass of, of, of a different superparticle. So it depends on the combination of these particles. This range gets ruled out, this range over here, or this range over here is still okay. And that is narrowing down the window of what sort of mass and interactions these superparticles can have. Uh, so mapping that back to dark matter is complex, but that's giving us real information about what the supersymmetric theory really is, and that tells us a lot about what our dark matter particle theories <coughs> could be. So we're basically using that to narrow down which of these things are still reasonable solutions. So that's what I'm going to talk about in um, collider searches. Um, they're really interesting. They're setting really uh, strong limits. It's um, the limits are all basically based in which quantum field theory for the interactions you're using. So there's a lot of complexity, and you have to go through a lot of options. Um, one thing with slightly less complexity is, is direct detection. And so what I'm looking for in direct detection um, is a much lower energy event. Um, in collider searches, I was looking at, at, <coughs> excuse me, at 14 TV interactions. And those 14 TV interactions we're actually capable of making new particles. Those new dark matter particles could come into existence in those interactions. Here I'm looking for very low energy interactions where a dark matter particle from the universe floating around comes in, and it bumps very rarely a standard model particle. And uh, what I'm looking for basically is the vibrations that it induces in the standard model particle when that bumping occurs. And this is really rare. Uh, a nice hint is, let's say I had a, a block of lead and I had a, a dark matter particle coming in. The weak force is very weak. So how often would I expect the weak force to be able to make the dark matter particle bump off this block of lead? The solution is it would have to go through an entire light year of lead before I expected one interaction. Um, and I can't make a detector that's one light year long. Um, so I'm going to miss most of my particles, which are almost all going to go right through. Um, so what I need, but, but I do have a lot of dark matter particles in the universe, right? There, there's, um, I actually, I put the number in the worksheet thing and I, I forgot it, so somebody might be able to tell me. Uh, let's see if I can work it out in my head. There's, a uh, like 300 million dark, no, no, it's about a billion dark matter particles going through a square meter per second. Um, which means that even if, you know, most of them escape through this whole, whole block, you know, one of them every once in a while will actually interact. Um, and you might be able to detect that. So we're looking for three different things that can happen when a dark matter particle bumps a normal standard model particle. Well, um, it can produce charge, 
if I have a nucleus, and the nucleus is surrounded by electrons, I have a dark matter particle come in and it hits the nucleus. Well, the nucleus will go on this way and it might lose one of its electrons, right? And I can look for that electrical signal because I'm good at looking for electrical signals, I'm like weak force signals in my detector. Uh, so that's, that's searching for charge. I can search for phonons, um, which is some element of vibration. Uh, so I have, a, I have a, like say, a really nice compact crystal uh, structure. I have a dark matter particle come in it bumps this nucleus, the nucleus jiggles, and this causes my whole crystal to jiggle, right? And I look for that jiggling that happened when the dark matter particle exchanged momentum with something in, in my detector. Um, and lastly, I can look for light. I uh, have a dark matter particle come in, it hits the nucleus, the nucleus moves, and then there's an electrical interaction that happens between this now moving, say, say atom, and the atoms around it. They bounce off of each other, they interact, that produces light, I can see that light. So these are the three things I could potentially search for in direct dark matter and detections. Uh, what the heck is a phonon? A phonon is, um, is a made up word, uh, which is like a photon in quantum field theory. So it's basically a single packet of quantized vibrational energy. So in the same way a photon is a quantized packet of light, a single light uh, a particle, this is a quasi-particle, it's not a real thing, but uh, that carries vibrational energy through a medium. So you can see here a, a hugely exaggerated phonon moving through a material. It made everything dense over here by compacting it, dense over here, and spaced out over here, just like sound does. So, so it's like sound, because it's, it's carried through a medium like vibration. <coughs> now it's really important um, that I am in a medium where I'm looking for dark matter interactions that are very rare, I need to make sure I'm not seeing all sorts of other things that bump into nuclei, right? And when we're up here on, on, the, on Earth, there's all sorts of cosmic rays coming down from the sky. Those cosmic rays are really high energy particles, um, and they're flowing through us all the time, this sort of radiation. And if I had a detector and I just stuck it up here, I would just get hit constantly by uh, muons coming in from the atmosphere, by uh, high energy uh, light and protons, and my detector would be going crazy all the time. Um, so you would never be able to detect the dark matter signal because you'd just be swamped by the signal of all these uh, events that, that occur constantly uh, from cosmic rays in space. Um, remember that these get to interact with the electromagnetic force, which is much, much, much stronger than the weak force. So they're very likely to interact with my detector, and the dark matter is very unlikely to interact. So I have to go way deep underground um, to get rid of this atmospheric uh, um, emission. So if you have kind of here, I, I, I pilfered the slide from Rick Gateskill. I pilfered a lot of these slides from different people. I should just, mm -hmm. in, in just generally uh, acknowledge all of them. Um, inside the Chernobyl uh, accident, inside the reactor itself, you would get about uh, 2 times 10 to the 8 uh, cosmic ray interactions per second, and that would kill you very quickly. Um, the actual rate, if you're inside, say, a CT scanner, is about 10 to the 3, so it's five orders of magnitude lower. Um, the average in the United States uh, is about uh, 15 uh, interactions per second. Um, I think these are gamma ray interactions, actually. Um, if you don't have, if you got rid of all the radon gas that's in the air, you would drop by a little bit. In, in Iran, where they're where they're spinning up nuclear centrifuges, it's higher. Um, if you go underground. Uh, you get rid of maybe a factor of 10 to the third, you go much cleaner, and you have less interactions. Um, and then you put a big water tank around it to get rid of more interactions, and you go into the center of your detector, you get rid of actually 15 orders of magnitude in, in terms of the number of baryonic interactions compared to us being on Earth. On Earth, standing up here, we are much closer to the center of the Chernobyl uh, reactor than we are to the center of these very pure uh, underground labs. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. Um, we get rid of a lot of radioactivity. Uh, average person is far too radioactive to be anywhere near the center of this detector. Uh, yeah, your average person, um, mostly due to radioactive potassium that's in your body, emits about 1,000 gamma rays per second. That would that would signal, you know, if you were sitting in the middle of the detector, that would be a thousand events per second. It would see due to you swimming around, um, and uh, that would just swamp out the signal. Um, you have to do some really nifty tricks to see this. 
Um, for instance, if you want to coat this detector in lead, well, some lead is radioactive um, um, because it's been on Earth, it's been hit by cosmic rays, it's absorbed radioactive carbon-14. There's been uh, nuclear weapons tests which deposit radioactive cesium and all sorts of things. Um, you have to use archaeological lead, so they go to uh, shipwrecks far beneath the ocean, from like uh, Rome or Greece or something like that, and they dig up this 2,000-year-old uh, lead. And this lead has not been exposed to cosmic rays for a really, really long time. And thus, the radiation levels in this lead are much, much smaller. Um, so you actually put these in the inner part of your detector. This sort of lead is what you build it out of um, in order to decrease the uh, radioactive background. The situation in direct detection is a lot different than in collider searches. In collider searches, we have one instrument, the LHC, and we have two detectors on it. We have ATLAS and CMS. In uh, direct detection, and, and the reason for that is because the LHC is expensive. In direct detection, these experiments are relatively cheap uh, at the moment, and we have lots and lots of different groups working on lots and lots of different detectors using lots and lots of different technologies. Um, so we have things called uh, bubble chambers, like the COOP experiment, which is the Chicago something something underground particle physics experiment. PICO is the new spinoff of COOP. Uh, this is, these are both based here at the University of Chicago. Um, we have liquid xenon experiments, and uh, also uh, liquid argon experiments, which use uh, large amounts of liquid noble gases, um, such as xenon-10, because it was 10 kilograms, xenon-100, for 100 kilograms, xenon-1 ton, because it was a ton, and uh, LUX, uh, which doesn't have a mass. We have uh, solid-state silicon and germanium detectors, like uh, CDMS and Cogent, Cogent also based in Chicago. Um, we have uh, silicon CCDs, which use uh, the same sort of charge uh, coupling devices that are used in your camera, uh, like Domic, also based in Chicago. And then we have uh, sodium iodide crystal detectors uh, like Dama Libra, uh, DM Ice, I should have listed down here, a couple others. So uh, maybe 15 ish experiments right now using uh, five independent types of technologies, and then there's a couple I'm not mentioning. And they all use different techniques. So to go back to this plot, and this one I stole from Laura Bodice, um, so um, in this, this has different experiments, and it points out what they're actually looking for, and some of them look for multiple different things. For instance, the uh, um, solid state detectors, the crystal detectors like um, CDMS over here, um, Cogent should be on this, but I don't see where they are, oh, they're here, um, can look for things like phonons and charge. Um, things like uh, the liquid xenon detectors will look for light and charge here. Um, and so they're looking for different aspects of this collision uh, in different ways. <coughs> so let's talk about a, uh, a detector like CDMS, which is a silicon germanium detector. What does it look for and what can it see? So this is a bunch of uh, plates of uh, silicon germanium crystals. Um, each one is separated. So here, here's a plate. Um, and I think the silicon germanium is actually in the center here. This is, I believe, the, the top layer that is used as a cover. Um, so a dark matter particle comes in and it hits either a silicon nucleus or a germanium nucleus in this. And that produces a vibration in this entire crystal, right? So the crystal starts vibrating just a little bit. And this vibration heats a tungsten layer, which is on the top here, um, and heats it up. The tungsten layer is presently superconducting. It's being kept very cold. And when something is superconducting, it means charge can flow through it freely with no resistance. Right? So, so you have some charge running over this very cold tungsten layer. Um, it heats up because it's getting hit by vibrational energy by phonons. This heats it up a little bit and causes it to not be superconducting anymore. And once it's not superconducting, it has a resistance to electrical impulses. So you know it's like having a copper wire and something putting a resistor in the center. You see a change in the electrical signal across that tungsten layer. Um, so what you're searching for is um, these uh, basically slight changes in the in the res resistivity and basically the electrical signal across the tungsten layer at the top that are induced by these slight vibrations inside the very cold crystal. So it's a very tricky technology, right? You have a, a number of layers of different things you're looking for um, in order to get an actual signal that you detect. 
So how do you differentiate, say, a dark matter particle coming in from some strange background that you thought you subtracted out that you hadn't gotten rid of yet? Well, backgrounds um, are usually um, uh, electromagnetic events. Um, they're not um, using the weak force. And so they mostly interact with the electrons that are surrounding the nucleus of some atom. Because there's a lot of charge there with independent electrons that you can interact, inter that you can interact with. The signal, a dark matter particle coming in, cares about the mass of the thing it's hitting, and so it mostly hits the, 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 the nucleus of atoms in the center. Electron recoils always knock out lots of electrons, because it's bouncing off the electron itself, it shoots it off. And so it produces a lot of charge, but not a lot of vibration, because electrons aren't very heavy, so if you hit one, it doesn't cause the whole crystal to vibrate very much. Nuclear recoils don't actually produce charge very often, because the nucleus is big and heavy, and it just vibrates a little bit, and no electron is going to you know, get knocked out of the crystal. Um, but it does produce a lot of vibration, because the nucleus is heavy. So you use the difference between the amount of vibrational energy that you see and the amount of electromagnetic energy that you see for, from these electrons to differentiate between these two signals. So that's a crystalline um, silicon germanium detector. And there's a couple, couple groups that use things like that. What about a liquid xenon detector? Well, here you're looking for, you have a liquid now. You don't have a crystal anymore. So liquids, right, the atoms can move with respect to each other. So you're not going to see nice vibrations through some sort of material because everything's already sloshing around. Um, so you have a dark matter particle come in, and it hits some xenon nucleus. And two things can happen. Um, you can have the ionization event. You can have the electron get freed again when the, when the xenon nucleus moves. And then you'll, you'll see that electron. What you do is you have this, this huge detector, this bath of liquid xenon. You put a big electric field across the, the liquid xenon detector, which is pointing up. That way, when you free an electron, the electron gets pushed up. And then you collect it up at the top of the, the instrument. Um, so you know, every time you free an electron, it gets bent by this electric field up to the top, where you have a collecting uh, device. You can do that. You can also just uh, have the, um, the xenon atom start moving quite a bit with respect to the rest of the instrument. And when it does, it will bump into other xenon and excite them. And uh, this will produce uh, uh, photons that you can see when the xenon atoms are bumping against each other and then cooling down again. Uh, so it produces, uh, in the case of xenon, 175 uh, nanometer light. It should be like blue or something like that. Um, so how do you differentiate between, say, the nuclear recoil that you want from your signal and the electron recoil in this sort of technology? Well, it's fairly similar. You're asking for the difference between uh, how much of this vibrational energy do you get, and, and then in the, in the case of these 175 nanometer photons, from the xenon nuclei bouncing off of each other, versus how much elect how many electrons did you see that made it to the top of your detector? Right. Again, uh, baryonic physics, electromagnetic interactions are going to produce lots and lots of electrons um, that move to the top of your detector, and the nuclear interactions are not. So you can see here. Here's a here's a simulation. Um, I, oh no, this is actual data, test data. Uh, I can explain how they did this in a second. So um, this is uh, things that you sent in that interacted with electrons. And this is basically how much um, electrons did you see divided by how many photons did you see uh, in terms of energy. And you can see that when you have electric interactions, all the points are up here. The nuclear interactions are way down here. So what they did to make fake dark matter nuclear interactions is they sent in neutrons, which are charged. And so they also tend to bump into nuclei. So here are your, uh, your, your, your test nuclear interactions, and here are your electron interactions. And you see if you made some cut here and only looked at the events down here, you would not have any background anymore. You would have gotten rid of all the electric interactions. The other thing you can look for, there's a second way that, uh, that the liquid xenon detectors can, can test this, is that electric interactions from, from, from uh, say, um, a stray gamma ray that gets in happen very quickly, right? The electromagnetic force is strong. So these, these things don't actually even make it into the middle of the detector before they interact with whatever xenon is on the outside of the detector. They usually interact at the edges. So the amount of background you get gets smaller and smaller as you go deeper and deeper into this one ton of liquid xenon detector. 
Um, and what that means is, um, if you can look only in this region here in the center, you know that your background is even lower than it used to be out here, right? And you can test, you, you, have it, you know how fast, how, how many interactions I should get here versus here versus here versus here. So if you've got a real signal someday, you can make sure that it doesn't follow that distribution. Most of the actual events aren't on the edges where you would have expected the background to be. Um, so, and how do, you, uh, how do you tell where the interaction occurred in liquid xenon? Well, you look for these electrons under the electric field, and you see how much time it took them to get up to the top of your detector. Right? If they happened right there at the top of the detector, then the electric field, you know what it is, and it doesn't take very long for the electron to make it to the top. Um, and for, for events down you know, in the center, it takes much longer for the electrons to make it up, um, and the photons move instantly, so you see those right away. So you have the difference between the electron and photon times. So these are complementary methods, right? There are two different ways looking for two different types of signals that can look for the same sort of nuclear recoils between dark matter um, and some, some very cool detector. Liquid xenon and, and kind of all these kind of liquid uh, Nobel gas, uh, liquid Nobel <coughs> gas, the uh, liquid Nobel materials are really nice because you can scale them up, right? I have one ton, well I just make another 10 tons of xenon and I make a bigger box and I pour it in. And the detector works about the same way. It's very easy to scale, and the interior of the detector gets colder and colder and less, or more and more background free as I put more and more liquid xenon around it on the outside. Uh, silicon germanium detectors can reach lower dark matter masses uh, than liquid xenon. Uh, the reason is, um, actually I'll, I'll show you this, I don't know what the reason is. Um, so, and this is a, it's a proven technology that's also been tested. The other reason you want both of these kind of sets of direct detection experiments um, is that you can make dark matter models that don't interact with xenon much. <coughs> Xenophobic dark matter. Um, <laughs> but maybe interact with silicon germanium detectors or have a mass that's too light to be seen easily by liquid xenon. So you want both these sort of technologies to get rid of those surveys. Um, this is kind of an incredible plot. This is the advancement of this field over the past uh, 25, uh, 30 years or something like that. Yeah, 30 years, which makes me old. Um, so this is the cross-section between uh, a dark matter particle and a nucleon. They're just assuming the dark matter mass is 60 GeV, so they can put it, or 60 proton masses, so they can put everything on the same plot here. Um, this is the first, um, um, you know, dark matter detectors in Homestead mine and Orville mines. Um, they could probe these interactions if it happened to this 10 to the minus 40 centimeters squared. Don't worry about the units. Um, Lux today could probe that in one minute. So this was like a six or seven year experiment. It can be done by, by the current Lux technology in a minute. Um, by 2000, we were probing these sort of cross sections a little bit lower here with these set of detectors. Lux could do this in about five minutes. Uh, by 2004, 2005, we were probing these. It would take our current instrumentation an hour to find these sort of dark matter candidates. Um, in 2010, we were getting up to 18 hours, and now we're just dropping off. I mean, this is actually, um, for people who like, um, oh, uh, what's, what's the law called where processor technology doubles? Moore's Law. Moore's Law, thank you. If you like Moore's Law, Moore's Law looks like this, and we are destroying Moore's Law, <laughs> like this. Right, so 2015, we have this detector here that's probing interactions that are 10 to the six times rare, a million times rarer than the interactions we were probing 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so uh, that's the future of this field. We're advancing very, very quickly to smaller and smaller types of interactions. Um, in terms of particle physics, there were a set of interactions that you could have expected to happen up here, which is why they were building these sort of detectors. Um, and this was if the dark matter particle interacted with standard model particles by exchanging Z bosons, it would happen up here. If it happens mostly by exchanging Higgs, it happens about down here. Um, and that's what we're probing today. So that's exciting. One thing we haven't discussed yet, and it's really important in this field, is uh, how, how fast are these dark matter uh, baryon interactions occurring at, right? So I'm not producing the dark matter in this sort of direct detection. I'm just taking the dark matter that's moving through my, in my universe, and I'm looking for this, this, this bumping between the dark matter and the normal particles, and that depends on how fast the dark matter is moving in the reference frame of the Earth, right? And I know how fast the sun is moving around the galaxy. We, we calculated that. We made these nice curves back in week one, around 225 kilometers per second. Um, that's the, the sun's motion. 
But we don't know what the dark matter velocity is because we haven't seen dark matter yet. Um, so instead we have simulations and we, we calculate our expectation. Uh, this is the dark matter velocity um, uh, around the center of the galaxy. It's, it's peaked here at around 250 or so kilometers per second. Um, but there's this distribution here, right? Um, and what the, this distribution is really important for direct detection. Because like there are particles down here, but they're moving very slowly compared to um, my detector. So when they bump into it, it's a very small bump and I don't see it. You know? um, most of the particles are moving at 250 kilometers per second, but most of my signal is going to come from these particles moving up here because they just they're bigger collisions. They're moving faster, they hit my detector harder, they're easier to see. Um, and so it's really important for direct detection to know not only about how fast dark matter is moving, but what the actual distribution of different dark matter velocities are um, in, in the uh, Earth's reference frame. Another uh, um, complication, or, or maybe opportunity, was pointed out that not only is, do I have all this dark matter around the galaxy that's been in the Milky Way for years, um, but I have dark matter that's um, falling in, right? And over the history of the universe, our galaxy has interacted with all sorts of galaxies. Dark matter sometimes gets pulled off those galaxies into ours. Uh, the Milky Way has certainly swallowed some other galaxies at some point in the past. So there are all these other dark matter blobs moving around. Uh, we don't know where they are. But they have velocities that are higher than, than the normal dark matter. They peak at around 350 or 400 kilometers per second. That's a really small portion of the total amount of dark matter. But because it's moving faster, it can lead to an actual enhancement in the, in the rate that we expect for dark matter interactions. This effect was first used um, by Donald Libra. Um, and, and Donald Libra is a... Um, uh, sodium iodide detector is a crystal. Um, and they decided let's dismiss with the idea of actually getting rid of baryonic backgrounds. That's hard, we have to do different tests of the amount of electrons produced and everything like that. Instead, let's just look for the following uh, physics. Well, the, the, the dark matter is always moving about 250 kilometers per second. It's moving mostly from left to right on the screen. The Earth is moving around the sun, and sometimes it's moving into this wind of dark matter, and sometimes it's moving with the wind of dark matter. And so you expect more interactions at a higher velocity when the Earth is rotating around the Sun in the direction that's facing the dark matter wind than when it's facing the other direction and moving along with the dark matter. So we'll just look for a modulation every year in the number of events uh, we observe. And they found one starting back, oh, was the, the, the time and day from the days there. I mean, this started back in like 1998, they started seeing this signal. Um, so every year, um, they see more uh, activity in June than they see in January, which is what you would predict. Um, so more, more dark matter events, and they've been claiming this signal for, I don't know, 12 years now. Um, that, that every year, it's, it's now a 9 or 10 sigma, you get more events in the summer than the winter. And there were other signals, so, so going through the history of the field, and it's got pretty exciting around 2010, 2011. Um, Cogent, um, Located in Sudan, Mines, in Minnesota, but also headquartered uh, partially here and partially at Pacific Northwest Labs, is a silicon germanium detector. Here's uh, Juan Collier, a professor at Chicago, but you can't tell, uh, holding off one of his silicon germanium crystals. And they found a signal, this was the Donald Labor signal here, uh, in terms of the cross section between dark matter and normal particles and the mass of the dark matter particle. So about 8 GeV to 12 GeV dark matter. Cogent found this signal that was right here. And it was Fairly similar to the Dama signal. Exciting. Crest, uh, I didn't talk about this technology. It's a super cool liquid detector. And I'm running all the time, so I'm not going to talk about this technology. They also found a signal. Uh, their signal is, uh, it depends on kind of how they, they do some uh, assumptions, but it's either here or here. Um, and it's also, you know, this is uh, down here, this is about 10 GeV. This is around, this is the cogent signal over here. This is one of the Dama signals. Uh, they're all kind of in the same area. This one is not the same as those, right? So they, they're finding an interesting signal. CDMS uh, was finding constraints. They weren't finding signals. Um, so here are some CDMS uh, constraints from uh, 2010 or 2011. Uh, they were ruling out this area up here. Anything to the right or above this line uh, was being ruled out in terms, again, dark matter mass uh, cross-section with protons, normal thing you see. But on the other hand, 
This is silicon, uh, um, the CDMS ticker is silicon germanium. This is from their germanium events. This is their silicon events. And while their germanium events weren't seeing anything, their silicon events were. Um, so there, there was a disagreement within the exact same detector. Um, in the silicon events, we're seeing some signal that's in blue here with huge uncertainties. But it was, that, that's cogent there in yellow now. Uh, they were about all consistent. Um, so this is, this is the state of the field about 2012 or so. <clears throat> Xenon 100 wasn't seeing anything at all. Um, and uh, Xenon 100, here's now this, this full range of, of dark matter masses going from five proton masses up to almost 1,000. They were rolling out anything above this line or to the right of this line. Uh, here's where cogent was. CDMS, this is the CDMS bounds. They don't have to show the CDMS plot here. This is where Donald was. And they were ruling out this area here. Um, and they were producing really, really strong limits down here. Like, for instance, this is, this is a Donald uh, possible fit. But cogent, uh, Xenon would have expected to see, you know, 10,000 events. They were ruling this out by factors of 1,000 or so. Um, if that was true. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty at low energies in these Xenon detectors. Um, and the reason is because xenon is really heavy. Uh, the xenon nucleus, it has about 100 protons and neutrons in it. Um, so if I have a, a really light dark matter particle come in, say it's five proton masses, and it hits a 100 uh, proton mass xenon atom, well, it bounces off, but the xenon atom doesn't move a lot. I don't get a lot of vibrational energy because it's a really light, you know, it's, it's a car running into a semi truck and looking for the vibration in the semi truck. It doesn't move much. Where the silicon germanium detectors down here, uh, like, C like CDMS, um, silicon and germanium are about 20 proton masses, or up to like maybe 50. So um, the uh, proton, that come, or the dark matter that comes in and hits these, is like a car hitting a car, and I see a lot more movement. Or in a, in a less catastrophic version, a ping pong ball hitting the ground, or like a basketball hitting the ground, and looking for the vibration in the ground. Um, this all correlated to what I call the mess plot. This is the state of the field as of 2012, and this was argued about uh, a lot at meetings and stuff. Because you had CDMS, Xenon 100, Zeppelin, some constraints from Ku, and they were all ruling out this stuff, which was seen by Cogent, Dama, uh, Crest, CDMS's other detector, and uh, maybe somebody else, I don't know. Um, and there was, there was huge disagreement you know, about Certainly experiments were wrong, uh, some were not agreeing with others, and uh, we didn't know what was right. Uh, but situations in science usually resolve themselves, and this one is starting to, I think, pretty clearly resolve itself. Uh, so Lux came along, uh, which uh, has better low energy reconstruction than Xenon. It's the same sort of liquid Xenon technology, but they do a, a couple things different. Here's where the Xenon 100 limits were at low energies. Um, the, uh, the Lux limits were over here. They were ruling out things better. Um, with, with basically less uncertainty, they were getting rid of this full parameter space. I, I think it's worth, let me just go back this way. Pointing out, it looks like this rules out this signal by like three orders of magnitude. It's way down here when the signal's way up here. But on the other hand, this thing is going up really, really fast over here. If I'm miscalibrating, my response at different dark matter masses by like a little bit over this direction, and I move this curve left to right, this constraint wasn't so constraining anymore, even though it looks constraining in, in the vertical direction. Xenon has moved things more to the left, and, and it looks better. In the same kind of last two years, uh, Cogent has found some problems with their analysis technique, that most of their events were happening right on the surface of the crystal where you expect background events to happen from, from, from baryons. Um, let's see, Dama is going to claim their signal exists forever, but, um, okay. Uh, it's now pretty strongly ruled out by, by other groups. Um, CDMS's silicon detection went away. Um, their constraints got a little bit better. Uh, so that's the state of the field now. Uh, and now they're, let's ask about what the future holds in about the, the five minutes that I don't have left. Um, so we're getting bigger and bigger detectors now because the, the way to probe rarer and rarer interactions is that you need more and more detector mass for the dark matter to bump into. And when you have bigger detectors with more and more mass, they cost more. Shocking. Um, so we started with 15 different groups 
running 15 different projects with five different uh, you know, uh, methods. Um, now we're trimming that down. We, we're, we're deciding which technologies work the best, which technologies don't work as well, which groups should combine to form a bigger next version of their detector, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think there was the, uh, the final uh, kind of a survey on the, on the next decade of particle physics is really moving us from a state of about 15 experiments to just a few, um, but they will be bigger and with more sensitivity. Um, so here's kind of where we are right now. These are where these signals were. This is the Lux data of 2013. Uh, Lux is now running a 300-day survey right now, and this should give us constraints, something like that, if there's no dark matter. There's a future experiment called uh, Xenon 1 ton that will be running soon and will, will give us much better sensitivity. Um, there are some experiments like Super CDMS is, is uh, the, the crystals are harder to scale up to like tons of crystals. You can't do that. So they're, they're, you can see they're rapidly losing this battle to liquid xenon in terms of masses up here. But where they're still really good is at low dark matter masses, where xenon just doesn't produce much signal because xenon's really heavy. Dark matter is not anymore. So uh, super CDMS is the new version of CDMS is concentrating on being able to do this low mass region down here where the, uh, the interactions aren't as energetic. Uh, eventually, there'll be an experiment called LZ. I think in the next maybe seven years or something like that will be built, and I think it's nearly, it's, oh, it's seven times. I was going to say 10. Um, and it's probably down here. And then you see this yellow area on the bottom. This is uh, the neutrino floor. Um, this is the interaction I expect between high energy neutrinos and my detector via weak force interactions, right? Because uh, neutrinos don't interact with light, they're all around us, and they do interact via the weak force. Uh, and a lot of them get emitted by the sun and elsewhere in the galaxy, and this is how much they're supposed to interact. So once I go below there, my direct detection experiment will start seeing signal, but that signal probably won't be dark matter. I'm going to have to deal with an actual background that I don't know how to get rid of yet. It just comes from neutrinos uh, from the sun. Um, so uh, this is kind of, we're getting close to this region. We're going to have to start thinking about it sometime in the next you know, few years. Some people already are. Um, but we have a lot of way to go, but hopefully we, we have a lot of chances to see dark matter in this intermediate region first. So I'll close there, and uh, thank you, and open for questions. smaller than that. On the other hand, there are many crystals in the CDMS detector. So that's one crystal. I think there are a couple. Of Lower before you got to neutrinos from things that aren't the sun. Does that exist? 
No, because the neutrinos don't interact with much, and so it's really hard to, uh, to stop them. So, um, but what you could do is if you had some directional information about which direction your, your xenon went, you would know which direction the, the dark matter or the neut neutrino came in from, and you would just get rid of all the ones that came from kind of the same direction as the sun. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know which direction the sun is in the sky, so you know which direction those neutrinos are coming, and you want to get rid of those events somehow. So some people are talking about dark matter direct detection experiments that have directional information. Uh, yeah. Um, love the idea of the neutrinos. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, just a remark. Uh, I'm kind of slow, and I, uh, yeah. I like to hear what you're saying, but I also like to try to read, you know. Well, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't try to. I, I, I can't figure out. This. I have to, you know. Uh, read the ordinate and the abscissa and the units and think about it a little bit and look at them and there's so many experiments and I'm not familiar with the names of all these. It's it's really information overload. Uh, so and sorry. I wonder if you could slow, slow down, down a little yeah. bit yeah. and sort of. Uh, I made too many slides this time. <laughs> uh, okay, it's good though. It's yeah. interesting. It really is. Well, in, in in five years there will be like ten less experiments, so it will be much better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you're next. To the you were talking about vibrations caused by collisions, the uh, nucleus vibrations. How do you detect those vibrations if they, let's say, dark matter collides with a xenon or some other? Yeah, two, What's two the... different ways depending on whether it's in a crystal or whether okay. it's in a liquid. So in a crystal, um, I mean, crystal atoms, you know, there's a rigid structure between every single nucleus. So if I vibrate one, everything else is going to vibrate. So what I'm looking for is basically you know, in a very small sense, I'm looking for the whole sheet Pink. of the crystal to vibrate. Um, okay. Not not in a visible way, but you know, right. the way you can detect it. In liquid, what I'm basically looking for is xenon to, a xenon atom to start moving and bounce off a bunch of other xenon atoms. Okay. And when that happens, the electrons in the xenon, you know, interact and bounce off of each other. That produces light, and that's yeah. what I see. And basically, I, I'm seeing the the radiation that results when the moving xenon atom slows down by hitting everything. So in your, um, I think you call them pseudo Feynman uh, diagrams yeah. of the collisions. Mm -hmm. um, you show two photons coming in, composed of some combination of quarks and gluons. Oh yeah, in the atmosphere. And uh, although you have the gray circle that says we have no idea what the interaction is, you right. have dark matter coming out. Yes. Does this imply that that's someone talking about? Like that. Does this imply that whatever dark matter is, it's some combination of quarks and gluons? And if so, if so, since we start out from the proposition that here's this stuff we have no idea what it is, why don't we assume so? Not so not quite. So so the yeah. So in this plot here. This is a quark and an anti-quark. So they have, uh, going back to last week, they have total quark number zero, total baryon number zero. Um, their charges are opposite each other, so those are zero. So everything on this side is zero. So whatever my dark matter produces um, couldn't have any sorts of quantum numbers at once, because I started with zero on this side. So as long as this has the negative of this, and they're, they're anti-particles of each other, um, then, then this is fine regardless of what the quark content of dark matter may or may not be. And, and it's not. We, we're sure it's not quarks actually because it doesn't interact strongly with dark matter, or else we would have seen it. I'm sorry, you said we're sure it's not? It's, it, we're sure that dark matter doesn't have quarks in it because um, quarks are colored, and so they have strong interactions. And strong interactions would be very visible because they are, they're very strong and happen a lot. I'm missing something here, though, because it's, I, I think maybe you answered it, but it's probably going right over my head. I, I, if you're talking about protons colliding with each other, all you got is quarks, uh, quarks and gluons, and you're saying that these colliders produce, uh, may produce uh, some rare events in which what comes out is dark matter particle, Right. wouldn't it have been whatever you put into it. Right, so, so to have like a, a lower energy inter interaction example, 
let's say I had a proton come in and a proton. So this is a proton and another proton. They collide. Um, some stuff happens. Right? Some stuff happens. I don't know what it is. Um, I have a proton come out. I have a proton come out. These started with a lot of energy, right? Kinetic energy. They hit each other really hard. So they also produce, say, an electron and a positron. Electron, positron. Um, so here, here is my interaction. I started with two protons. I ended with two protons. But that kinetic energy, that velocity that they hit each other with, got transformed in this interaction to an electron-positron pair. Now, all of the um, quantum numbers that I started with stay the same. I, have to, I start with two protons. I, start, I end up with two protons and two things that cancel exactly in every single quantum number because they're antiparticles of each other. Um, momentum gets conserved, or total energy gets conserved because they started with kinetic energy. Now everything over here is moving slower. Um, and so that's how, you know, this could be electrons, but this could also be dark matter. And anti dark matter, um, for reasons we talked about last time, we think dark matter might be its own antiparticle. So it would just be two dark matter particles. It could also be that there's dark, anti dark matter that's also fine. But so I could do, I could produce this sort of thing as well. Now um, in the LHC, like I said, the energy is too high for it to be proton collisions, but you just replace this with uh, quarks. Um, you end up with quarks instead, and that's a that's a valid Feynman diagram. So I'm, I'm using that kinetic energy of that collision. That's what the LHC is doing. It's producing a, a lot of kinetic energy in a collision that I get to chain, turn into anything. Else. So it's the energy. It's the energy that goes into the dark matter. Yeah. I'll put that in my pipe and smoke it. Colliding brains. See what happens. What? We should stop colliding brains. <laughs> I uh, there was an onion article about this one. Basically, physics, physicists were concerned that compared to that biologists, they weren't torturing mice enough. <laughs> so there was the, the mouse high energy kinetic collider <laughs> that, that put mice in a particle accelerator and looked for the kinetic rebound of mice brains as they hit walls or something like that. Otherwise known as football. Yes. In the back. Wait. Uh, certainly, uh, we find things that we don't expect. Uh, so far, they've been boring things, like backgrounds that we didn't expect, or not necessarily boring, I guess. But you know, now we're so you know, uh, you 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 find a signal in some detector, and you realize that there was something radioactive next to it, and yay, it produced a lot of this. Um, so yeah, uh, if you put a banana near your detector, it will go off and save me. Because potassium forty uh, makes it yeah. So you no know bananas in underground labs. Eat bananas every day. Yeah. Um, we found things like that. We're hoping to find you know new particles at the LHC. Um, and if we don't, um, so the original design for the LHC was that it would be a fourteen TeV collider. Um, there were some issues with the magnets when it was first installed, and it ended up running for two years as a seven and then an eight TeV collider. Um, it's now been offline for a year, it's come, or a year and a half. It's coming back up in the next two or three months at 14 TeV. I think there's the 13 and then 14 TeV. And that's really where we want to be for finding supersymmetry that solves the problems with the Higgs mass that we want to solve. Um, so we're really hoping that you know a year of LHC data or something like that is really going to shine the light on something new. And if it's not, that's almost more interesting because it means we really have to rewrite some theories. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, if there are supersymmetry particles, which mostly they are much heavier than that, yeah. what the hell are they? <laughs> so, um, well, hopefully one of them is the dark matter, <laughs> like um, and the rest have decayed, probably. Right. Um, so, very heavy things are not usually very stable. Um, they decay into lighter things. So that's why the the, the the things that make up our universe are electrons, which is the lightest lepton, uh, lightest charged lepton at least. 
uh, you know, protons, which are composed of up quarks and down quarks, which are the two lightest quarks. Um, and those light things make up all the universe we see. We don't see things like, you know, uh, W bosons or Z bosons very often either, because they're heavy and they quickly decay in other things. Um, so the same with supersymmetry. Everything should decay, except maybe the lightest supersymmetric particle, which can't decay due to some quantum number that it has that it needs to conserve. And that would, that would make it the W particle. So hopefully there's a lot of it out there. It's just, um, if that, that, you know, um, if the lightest supersymmetric particle interacted with light, which could have been reasonable, uh, then we would see a lot of it. Because it would be a really heavy particle, but there would be a lot of it. It would interact with light, and it would show up in detectors and all sorts of stuff all the time. We'd be pretty familiar with it now. Um, also, I guess uh, there would be actually almost none of it because uh, it would have coupled much more effectively in the early universe and would have annihilated itself away. Uh, you need the weak force to get the right annihilation cross section. Um, so, but yes, you would have detected that particle or particle accelerator by now. Hopefully, uh, we're getting near the mass that we're going to find these things in particle accelerators. Yep. Yeah. What is the range of that estimate of the mass where we are today? Uh, the, with the mass of? Of the dark matter. Uh, the particle. Um, so if you, it comes basically from supersymmetry uh, and from the fact that it's a weak interaction. So the important supersymmetric particle is, is the stop, the super partner at the top. And that's needed because it cancels out uh, some, some set of interactions which would make the Higgs, the mass of the Higgs boson really, really high, or actually infinitely high. So you need a, a particle uh, that cancels those Feynman diagrams by giving you the opposite Feynman diagrams. And um, that tells you that the mass of the stop needs to be about a TeV or a few TeVs at most, or, or lighter. So it can't be that heavy. Um, and um, you want the stop because the stop is colored and it's not uh, not our dark matter because it's a colored particle. You want that to not be the lowest supersymmetric particle, the, le the least massive one. You want something to be lighter that, that is only weakly interacting. So you probably want it to be less than some TeVs. Uh, you can do things to make the, the supersymmetric particle heavier than the stop, that's fine. You can do some things to make the par supersymmetric particle much heavier. But kind of the natural region you want to be in is a particle that's between maybe 10 proton masses, uh, 10 GeV, up to maybe 10,000 GeV, somewhere around there. Uh, so it's a big range. Um, you know, there's a lot of experiments that look for these sort of things. Um, and of course, what we know is the, um, the, the mass density of uh, dark matter. We know that it's about 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter of dark matter around us. Uh, if I make the particle itself heavier, that means there are less dark matter particles in the universe to create the same energy density of dark matter that we see. Um, so it gets harder and harder to search for heavier and heavier particles just because there aren't as many of them. Right? Um, there are less particles making the same amount of mass from dark matter. So it gets harder to search for these things. Is there a connection between antimatter and dark matter? Um, possibly. Um, it's not something I think I'm going to discuss here, but I think talks, but I think it's worth maybe a question talking about. So um, there's another solution to the question of why about five times as much dark matter as regular matter, um, which is um, it's, you can link it to the question: Why are there? Why is there a lot of matter in our universe and not a lot of antimatter? Right. And so, you can have a scenario where um, dark matter and matter interacted in the early universe, and dark matter carried away the anti uh, matter. Or basically, there was some asymmetry in antimatter and matter and dark matter, and that, through its interactions, produced the same asymmetry. In, uh, in the matter that we see in the universe. Um, so then uh, that kind of leads you to a dark matter particle that's about five times as massive as the, the uh, uh, proton, and that gives you about five times as much dark matter mass in the energy density in the universe than the proton. So that's called asymmetric dark matter. Um, the, um, and it can be searched for in these sort of events kind of the same sort of way. 
Um, and it's not motivated by supersymmetry in the same way anymore, but it's motivated by other solutions to this kind of wink and mirror question. Um, so, so a lot of people are looking for that. I, I actually uh, wrote a paper on these sort of models. Uh, uh, I think I got picked up on Wired News last week or something like that. So, uh, um, but you can search for these actually in neutron stars. Maybe I'll talk about that though last week or something because it's kind of fun. Is, excuse me, is that published now? That yeah, it is. Do you know where? Uh, it's on. It's in Wired News. Right. Yeah. Uh, just it's a fun story. I don't know. <laughs> it's not the most serious research paper I've ever written, but it is. The That's most okay. Fun. I might understand. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs> See you all the next couple weeks. It'll be three weeks of indirect detection. So. <laughs>